What I want to start with is something I, I had been uh, confronted with this past week that I just thought was amazing. How many of you, just out of curiosity, have seen the 1935 version of The Bride of Frankenstein? Like two of us. Two of us. No, well, okay, three, good. I mean, well, it, it, it's a classic. And there's this one scene in there that I find really poignant even after all these years. So, as you know, Frankenstein's monster, right? He's out and trying to figure out life, and he's struggling. He's somehow survived the first movie. And, and he happens upon a cabin in the woods where this guy is playing violin. He discovers music for the first time. He, he decides to go in, and this man is blind. And because he's a blind man, he doesn't see the monster that Frankenstein's monster is. And he offers to have him come in and take care of him. And as he's doing so, the, uh, the monster, you know, just kind of responds with his grunts and that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm looking for... So as he, he says to him, he says, wait, 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 let me get this right. You can't talk, right? Because I can't see. And so he couldn't see the fact that he was a monster. And he says, well, this is, this is fantastic. Why don't you just come in? We'll be friends. Uh, I'll take care of you, and you can be there. And as a matter of fact, as, as he cares for this monster, the monster just calms down. He lays down in bed, and the man prays this prayer. He says, Our Father, I thank thee that in thy great mercy, this is the scene where he's doing it, Our Father, I thank thee that in thy great mercy thou hast taken pity on my great loneliness. And now out of the silence of the night has brought two of thy lonely children together and sent me a friend to be a light to mine eyes and a comfort in time of trouble. Amen. You see, and it began because he says to him, he says, you know, you, you can't speak and I'm blind. It looks like we're both afflicted. We've been doing this series on... Uh, Character cultivation, this idea that God is transforming us. Because there's a difference between a heart that is simply constrained, that we have kind of forced ourselves to do the right stuff, compared to if really God transforms our heart. And if God truly transforms our heart, things are just different. And so it's kind of hard to give you a to-do list uh, in looking at this because we're looking for a transformed heart, not just a constrained one, right? Well, we're going to continue that as we talk about kindness and goodness. And specifically this phrase, I choose to do the right things in my relationships with others. We long to do that. When we talk about kindness and goodness... We're all gonna, we often talk about it together because of the fact that kindness is really about the perception of the receiver. It, it has a huge lexical breadth in the, as it's used in the Bible. It can mean things like compassion. It can mean things like honesty. It's, it talks, it's a lot of stuff, and it's often labeled in there with goodness, where goodness, kindness might be like doing something that you think is really nice. Goodness is me doing something regardless of whether you think it's good, but it's actually good. You know, the kind of tough love, goodness can have that. So we talk about them together. It's clearly a relationship thing. Matter of fact, this passage in 1 Thessalonians, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. So clearly the idea is that we should be kind and good in our relationships. The thing is, I want to just pivot a little bit this morning and talk about kindness and goodness in one relationship in particular. I want to talk about friendship. And that's the first blank in your outline. The reason I want to talk about friendship is I really just believe, as a culture, we are really cruddy at doing it. We have all kinds of difficulties truly being friends. And it's vital for us. I can't think of an issue in a relationship that is more misunderstood in our culture, that we are in more desperate need of, and we don't do it well. 
There's an article that came out a number of years ago that I thought was done really, really well. It was called Facebook in the Crowd. And as the man writes, he says, you know, one day last summer, he says, I logged on to Facebook and I realized that I was very close to having 700 online friends. Not bad. I thought to myself, absurdly proud of how many cyber pals and connections and acquaintances and even strangers I'd managed to sign up. So as he goes further in the article, he says, I, so I decided to have a Facebook party. I used Facebook to create an event, invite my digital chums. Some of them, of course, didn't live in Toronto, but I figured it's summer, people travel, you never know who might be in town. And as he goes further and, you know, people begin to respond and say, well, I'm thinking about being there, or maybe I'll be there, or I will be there. He says, on the evening in question, I took a shower, I shaved, I splashed on my tingly man perfume, put on new pants and a favorite shirt, brimming with optimism, I headed over to the neighborhood watering hole, and I waited, and waited, and waited. And eventually, one person showed up. Talks about this uh, person that he had didn't even really know. Had been a friend, they sat there awkwardly having their conversation, saying, well, maybe other people are going to show or whatever, and tried to make it less awkward. Says after she left, I renewed my vigil, waiting for someone to show. It was getting on 11 o'clock and all my rationalizations, for example, that people needed time to get home from work, eat dinner, relax a bit, were wearing out. He says, I ordered one more drink. The beer arrived, a British import, young doubles chocolate stout. He says, I raised my glass on a solitary toast and promised myself I'd spend less time online. Then I took a gulp. It was delicious but bittersweet. 700 friends, and I was drinking alone. I think that is, in many ways, a metaphor for our entire culture. We have people we know, we connect with, we are friends with online. I mean, it's in the name, they must be friends. Surgeon General came out with something a, a couple years ago that literally labels that we have a loneliness epidemic in our country. And that loneliness is so acute that it is, in terms of premature death, the medical equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day, according to the Surgeon General. We are struggling deeply. I don't think we have the capacity, we don't have the know-how, and we definitely don't have the relationships of friends. And this is of particular import to me because we are called Linwood Friends Church. How many of you know where that name comes from? Any idea? Uh, three or four of us, okay, are willing to admit that. Well, here it comes from this passage that we're going to read here in John 15. And it, uh, it's specifically the idea, the name associated with the, with the Friends Church. And I want to read this as we listen to Jesus. This is probably the preeminent. I have seen nothing in any of my reading in any other kind of context that hits this level of what it means to be friends. This is Jesus speaking, and he says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I choose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. The idea of friendship is the idea of exhibiting kindness and goodness. To truly love 
in the life of someone else to give unto them what they need, whether they like it or not, but and also to really just be a friend. So we're going to talk about that because here's, here's, okay, real simple. Two things that we can do to really be friends with people. The problem is, as I share this, I, I, I need you to know, obviously you do not have to have a relationship with God to have friends in life. That's not, uh, there are people that don't have a relationship with God that have friends. But as we're going to see here, and as we look at this, we're going to see that, that this, this empowers us to this whole deeper level of a reality that I don't think our culture gets. So I want to give you these two keys, and as I tell you, I, I have it labeled here, keys to understand and do, because if I were to just give you some commands, go do these things to make friends, that could work. It's also describing what true friends are. But let's look at it according to this passage. The first, simply going to label, that transparent vulnerability. Transparent vulnerability. He talks about the fact that, uh, you know, he uses this phrase, Jesus does, says, to remain in me. To remain, he's talking about, like, matter of fact, for those of you familiar with John 15, the passage right before is this whole imagery of, I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. That idea of remaining, and he switched the metaphor from vine to that, to that of friends. And he's saying that we need to remain, he says, remain in me. That idea of that we are living life. True friends would live life with one another. They would be vulnerable. They would be connected. Knowing things, living things, it's just, it's less about even the relationship and more about living life together. The fictional account, obviously, of Lord of the Rings. You have Frodo and Sam. As they go about, like, returning that ring and the whole quest, and they're just side by side. Literally, at one point, Sam carries Frodo because he's going to, we're going to do this bird together. We're going to go together. We're going to live this. We're going to eat together and sleep and move and accomplish these things in life together. Or I love the way um, Samuel talks about Jonathan and David. For those of you who are not familiar with the story, David grew up in the household of Saul the king, and Saul's son, Jonathan, was there, and Saul was kind of a crazy guy. He kept his spear near him all the time and was always chucking it at people. And uh, David was the victim of that sometimes. And Jonathan just says, you know, they became deep friends, and I love the way the King James specifically puts it. And it came to pass when he was made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. I mean, that kind of imagery of a deep friendship that is that our souls are knit together. That kind of transparent vulnerability. The thing is, I don't think our culture would get it. I have seen... A number of things written about David and Jonathan specifically says, well, they can't really have a soul that's knit together unless they're lovers. They must be lovers. That's the only way they would be that close. We can't have somebody that close to us without really being something else. We don't even understand friendship. I, I remember reading uh, Hamilton by Chernowitz that the musical Hamilton was based off of. And there's an entire section because Hamilton talked about his friends and would say that he loved them and he cared for them deeply. And he would say these things and, and they couldn't get it. That they, he ended up saying there were a number of scholars who were like, well, they must, he must really be, they must be lovers because they can't be friends and really love that deeply. And so he had to point out that that's not true. That's not how people operated. That they would often talk about their deep love for one another even among their friends. So one of the, the greatest books on this, uh, The Four Loves by C.S. Lewis, and he has this whole chapter on friendship. And he talks about the reality and, uh, of what that would mean, and I love some of these things. He says, you know, the rest of us know that though we can have erotic love and friendship for the same person, yet in some ways there is nothing less like a friendship than a love affair. 
Lovers are always talking to one another about their love, but friends hardly ever talk about their friendships. Lovers are normally face-to-face, absorbed in each other's. Friends are side-by-side, absorbed in some common interest. You see that there's something that binds that, 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 that transparent vulnerability, that life that we're living together. You and I are friends as we go about doing life together, that we're on the mission to drop the ring into the fires of Mount Doom. We are on a mission to, to do something, and, and we be friends together side by side. He later says, friendship arises out of mere companionship when two or more of the companions discover that they have some insight or interest or even taste which the others do not share and which till that moment each believed to be his own unique treasure or burden. The typical expression of an opening friendship would be something like, what? You too? I thought I was the only one. That's why I started with this bride of Frankenstein, that, that this blind man and, and the monster, that he looks and says, really, you too? You are afflicted too? You struggle too? That we are together, that all of a sudden, we, we thought we were alone, but we are together in this, and that kind of transparent vulnerability. Telling, living life, telling secrets to one another, knowing what's going on. One more from the book. Hence, we picture lovers face to face, but friends side by side. Their eyes look ahead. That is why those pathetic people who simply want friends can never make any. Because the very condition of having friends is that we should want something else besides friends. Where the truthful answer to the question, do you see the same truth, would be, I see nothing and I don't care about the truth, I only want a friend. Well, then no friendship can arise. Though affection, of course, may, there would be nothing for the friendship to be about, and friendship must be about something. Even if there was an only enthusiasm for dominoes or white mice or those who have nothing can share nothing. Those who are going nowhere can have no fellow travelers. You see, so part of that idea of really living in the kindness and goodness of, of, of being friends, of having deep friendships, is to say that there is some truth, there's some mission, there's some life that we live together. For those of you paying attention, I think you can see kind of where I might be going with that when it comes to living life together as the church. But we'll get there in a second. Because not only would we need to have transparent vulnerability, the other thing mentioned in the passage, oh my goodness, I am all over the map on this. Wow, I have really messed up these slides. All right. The next blank is sacrificial commitment. Is that anywhere in there? Do I have that on the slides anywhere? I am such a mess. Okay, well, if you find it. The next blank is sacrificial commitment. Not only would we have transparent vulnerability, but we would have sacrificial commitment in the sense that we will be willing to pay the cost. Notice that it says there in the passage about, uh, you know, that we would lay down our life for our friends. There's this idea that it will cost us something, and probably nothing greater in our time, in our culture, than frankly spending time. It is so hard that we don't want to spend time. We 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 are so struggling that that it's so hard to hang out with folks, to be on a mission with them. That's how we can have 700 Facebook friends and nobody shows up, because Facebook doesn't require time. It doesn't require, I just, well, I don't know, it seems to suck a lot of time for some people, but you know what I'm saying. And so this idea of as as to to truly live life and to lay that down for one another. There's a beauty to living, and it's going to involve showing up. If all we want to do is, you know, get done with our stuff, go home and sit on the couch and see what Netflix has to offer for the day and rinse and repeat except for some periodic other, like, we're going to miss out on one of the things that God has for us in this kindness and goodness of really living life with other people. 
And the truth is, is I think we want it. I think you and I really, really do want deep relationships with other people as friends. And the idea that someone would come along and be willing to be transparently vulnerable with us, that they're willing to tell secrets and share secrets, that, that they're willing to be sacrificially committed to us, that they're willing to pay the cost, that sounds wonderful, but there is so much stacked against us. So if I just tell you, go do that, that's not going to be enough. It's so not going to be enough. We've got so much stacked against us. Our culture is built to keep us away. Take the fact, I've shared this before, but the idea that even architecturally, our houses have moved from having big front porches to big backyards. It, we, we, the idea of sitting out on your porch, because nobody had air conditioning, and you sit out on your porch and somebody's walking to the grocery store because they only had one car and that was already at work, and, and you say, hey, how's it going today? And you talk to your neighbor and you find out, hey, today was cruddy. It was like one of the worst days of my life. Well, now if you have one of the worst days of your life, what are you going to do? Call your friend, drive 20 minutes at best, text them, like, how does that work? And, and, and it does, but it seems so anemic to what we really need. And our culture makes it harder for us to connect, not easier. So we've already got that stacked against us. And then the second thing, and probably even bigger, is just our own fear. To, to, to go and live sacrificially, to, to pour out our lives to someone else, to share our secrets, and to do that. I mean, Tim Keller, who I, a lot of this information was new to me until he was sharing it, that, that says that you know, we all say we want community until we realize it involves vulnerability and commitment. And then we, we don't, we're busy. We don't have that. So how is it then if we know that we're going to pour into some people and they're just not going to reciprocate, how do we even get the power to do something like that? And I think that's the real key here. This is what changes us as folks that are following Jesus as he transforms our hearts that makes friendship deeper and more meaningful and more possible is because of this deep reality of finding the power. Let's see, I'll, we'll just give up. I've got it all written down here. The first is to understand how we find the power is we take Jesus as our friend. That's the next blank in your outline. Take Jesus as our friend. What do you make in this passage when Jesus says, I no longer, well, he says, I call you now my friends. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. See, what he's doing here is he really Look, I, I've talked with folks who really think it is, what, sacrilegious, really demeaning to God to somehow suggest that he could be your friend. They think, you know, that, that God has to be separate. He is a commander. He is a boss. You must submit. You must serve. And while that is true in, in Scripture as well, the fact is, as Jesus says, I call you friends. I long for that with you. I, Because it's, it, it's not just me as a boss. I don't have to explain anything to you. You don't need to know anything. I'm the commander. He says, I let you know my business. That Jesus is demonstrating this idea of transparent vulnerability when he's saying, I want to tell you what I'm doing in this world. I want to tell you what we're doing together, like how I'm going to transform the world, how it's going to be better. I want you to see that. I want you to be a part of that. We're going to live that together. He showed that vulnerability in coming to earth in the first place. Shedding part of his power to humble himself, to be one of us. That he is willing to be rejected all the time. God is offering his love to people. People saying, you know what, no, I got other things to do. There are other things that are more important. And he is willing to be vulnerable. Each and every one of us that have a connection with Jesus, we have the option to not. He is willing to be that vulnerable with us. And he tells us his secrets. He tells us his plans. He tells us in some cases in his word what, what he's after and what he wants in our life and the lives of, the, of others. I love the way Psalm 25, 14 puts it. In the NIV it says, The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. But in the 
the Living Bible, because of that translation and lexical breadth of the word, it says, friendship with God is reserved for those who reverence him. With them alone, he shares the secrets of his promise. He's willing to share with us. And of course, the idea of sacrifice, him willing to come to earth, die, so that we could be in connection with him. Scripture says, while we were still enemies, he died for us. That we can be friends with Christ. And that means not only accept him as friend, but the last blank in our outline is be a friend to Jesus. Oh, thank you. Be a friend to Jesus. So that we live in vulnerability and commitment with him. Again, he says, remain in me. If we are to be friends with Jesus, it's going to involve our time. We're going to have to spend time in scripture to hear from God, to hear what he says. I mean, do we care enough to, to hear what he might say, to listen? We're going to spend time in prayer to speak to him. Like, be in relationship. And it's going to mean time together as a church. You see, because with other folks that say, yes, I want to be a friend with Jesus, that we are together, you realize what we're doing right here this morning is an enactment of living that life together. That Jesus says, I'm living my life with Ray, and I'm living my life with Naomi, and I'm living my life with Corey. And as we get these three together, and as they see, you begin to see more and more, because friendships and the mission that Jesus has for us, we see it better as more of us get together to do that. We need each other to see what that means and to live that life. It also means we reciprocate in obedience. You are my friends if you do what I command. Again, that can seem like that submission and commander and boss-like thing, but the truth is, is Jesus never gives us any of the commands just to test us to say, I know this will make them really miserable. That'll be fun to see if they'll faithful enough to do it. But instead, he's like, I... We've got this mission we're on together. We need to do this together. I've got the best plan. And, and if we can just go along together, this is going to be amazing. Whether we like it or not, whether we understand it or not, obedience is going to be part of our friendship with Jesus. And if we can internalize that truth, that we already have the best friend we could ever have, it makes it possible to extend that to others. And you know why the church is so vital in that? I mean, just in this room here, I know a lot of us are gone. I know a number of families have been gone on vacation this week and have different stuff. But even with the folks in this room, this if some guy were getting around saying, you know what, I'm going to design a group of people that are going to be friends, it wouldn't be this group. I mean, in many ways, culturally, the way this, but this is, we are designed to be enemies. Right? I mean, there's, there's social media and people telling us you don't vote the same way. You don't look the same way. You aren't the same age. You aren't the same race. That all these things are all over the place. So you should be enemies with one another. And we say, uh-uh. We are here because we are on a mission from our best friend, Jesus Christ, who's calling us to something so powerful and so deep that we, who would otherwise be natural enemies, have this mission together for the kingdom of God. And because of that, we are side by side, arm in arm, going forward to what God has for us. To love him, love one another, and live out our faith every day. Amen? Let's pray. Gracious and heavenly Father, God, I have to be honest, I don't, I don't get why you'd want me as your friend. So many times I choose to go my own way and not be a very good friend to you. I wouldn't say my life is characterized by obedience, much less scripture and prayer and worship. I want it to be. I mean, the truth is, Lord, I do some of those things, and, but I want to be a better friend. And, and the fact that you're just saying, hey, I forgive you. I know what you're made of, but I still choose you is mind-boggling to me. 
So, Lord, forgive me and lead me on. Help me to be a true friend to you. And that involves practicing that kindness and goodness to other people, not in some transactional way like this world tells us. Hey, follow me and I'll follow you back. Let's network. But instead, that I just begin to express that with folks in my family, with my spouse, with my church, with my neighborhood, with this broken, messed up country. Lord, that we would love deeply. Transform my heart. In Jesus' name. Amen.